I want to um, take a look at this subject from a didactic point of view rather than practical, experiential, and uh, stories of experiences that I've had over the years. Uh, I, um, I remember as we looked at the subject of death and dying that it's one of the subjects in the field of mental health that over many years has received almost no attention. If we go back to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, which are the years that myself and some of us experienced, there was no information, there was no issues of mental health to guide people through the issues of death and dying. And I want to say something right from the get-go. We are all terminal. All of us who are sitting around this table, we are all terminal. We will one day not be on the face of this earth. And yet, precious little attention has been given over the years to the subject of death and dying. In the last um, two decades, I would say, medical schools have begun. It sounds amazing, doesn't it, people who are in the field of medicine? And in the last two decades, the area of death and dying has gotten some play in medical schools, but not nearly enough. The, um, the person who I have enormous amount of regard and respect for is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Some of you may have heard of her. She's, it, she has an iconic name in this field. She, um, she published a book in 1969. Thank you. She was a Swiss-American psychiatrist, and she worked in the area of hospice initially, and she came upon this issue of death, and few people had any information for her, people in the field, people who were experts. And she did something that was incredibly brave. She did a study with hundreds and hundreds of people who were terminal. And she talked with them and with their families as well, but her work was primarily with the people who were dying. You know, it's very interesting. I was speaking to someone earlier today at this conference and I said, you know, we use words, even in language today, this is a very sophisticated group of people here today, yet we say, he passed away, or he passed. He passed where? He died. How many people say, oh yes, yes, my, um, my brother died four years ago? No, most people say he passed away four years ago. Why do we use like a Lush and Nakia to express something that's very real, and very immediate in our lives. Excuse me? Lobe Ibrit. What? Lobe Ibrit. Okay. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay. Anyway, Elizabeth um, Kubler-Ross created a, um, a paradigm about death and dying. And when her book came out, uh, she initially received a lot of accolades for her work because it was tremendously tremendously innovative, and yet later she received a tremendous amount of criticism for what she did. Uh, she laid out five stages that a dying person goes through, and it became the Bible for many people in the field of mental health. There were five stages, and her, her theory was that people go through these stages as they face death. And yet, uh, she received a lot of criticism because they said it's not an exact process. They don't go from stage one to stage two to stage three. And she presented these are five stages, and people move back and forth between these stages. There is no one system that works for every single human being. We are all our unique selves, and we operate in very different ways. I want to go through uh, some of the thought that went into the stages, and uh, I would like it to be interactive, so 
uh, if you feel that you want to volunteer something or share something, please feel free to do so. The, uh, the first stage that she talks about is denial. A person hears from a doctor or from a loved one that they have a disease, an illness, and nothing more can be done. That everything that was possible was already done, and we need to make you comfortable for what lies ahead. So that first stage, as you can imagine, for many, many people, and by the way, this includes the family as well. We're not just talking about the individual. And um, the dynamic is also always very fascinating between what goes on with the individual, who we don't even know, maybe is prepared to understand that they're facing their own finality, <coughs> and yet maybe the family is not ready. I just want to interrupt myself and tell you a fascinating story that I um, read about in a study quite recently. They asked people in their 50s and 60s if one day you are close to dying, do you want us to exercise heroic measures? And people say, no, no, just let me die in peace. I really don't need that. Let it be. What are Sorry? Um, and when, when people are in their 70s and 80s and they're asked, should we try heroic measures, invariably, not only the individual, but the family, try everything. <laughs> Why? Because we want to conquer death. We cannot bring ourselves to face the end of a human being and the, the ending of that relationship in life with that individual. Can I just yes, something? of course. I just went through the experience with my mother a year ago. And previous to that, she had been suffering a lot. And um, she kept saying, I want to go, I want to go. Please just let me go. I want to go, I want to go. Every time she got to that point where she was really seriously ill again, she would say, call the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> this is a woman that kept saying, I, I can't go on like this, right? So it, they don't really want to go until it's really... Sure. Some do. Some are prepared to go, and sometimes the family holds them back. You know, stay with us. We need you. You're in our lives. You're our strength. We look to you. You are the matriarch of our family. So it really depends. Does anyone... Want to share anything else? Just going around the room. I can just say I, I, yes. I work as a, med a medical case manager. I deal with death and dying all day long. And I hear these things too. But I can tell you that in almost all cases, not all, not all, that when it gets right down to it, and I had a client, who, a doctor, who's still alive, who had told me when I first took him out as a patient, what can I do? We both know you have an incurable disease. He's a doctor. We're not going to fool him. But what can I do to make your quality of life better? He said, kill me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I have some issues with that. Like, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> OK. Uh, give me plan B. So he said, sedation. OK, I can do that. And then he got COVID. And he got very, very, very sick that none of us thought he would make it. And then one night, he asked to speak with me. And I went there at 9.30 at night. And he's crying. He says, I don't want to die. Mm. And I said, then don't. He says, I don't have control. I said, you have some control. And I gave a story of Sikh Yahoo, um, how he got another 15 years of life, doing tshuva. So that was three years ago. He's still alive. When? So people, as you were saying, when it comes down when? to it, there can be a real different story when they're really facing mortality. Sure. We've all read books or seen movies or heard stories of um, soldiers in uniform who come to a house and knock on the door and the adult son of this couple is a soldier and the woman sees someone knocking on her door with uniforms and she opens the door a crack and they say we're here to talk to you and she slams the door. Why? Because if she slams the door, 
it won't happen. Now that's irrational and we know that, but it's completely, completely an emotional response to a terrible fright. And when we're in such a state, we may do things that are irrational. If I lock the door and never open it, my son will live, which is of course not true. But she knows she cannot hear that harsh reality right now. So there's different examples that you brought here. Yes. You started off by talking about people that are terminally sick and how they deal with it and how the family deals with it. And now you gave the example of a soldier and his parents in the house and that. And there's a very big difference because however painful it is to lose a parent, and it's very painful, talking from it obviously from my own experience, um, we all know that this is the way of the world and this is what it will ultimately be not, as you just started off by saying, we're all, we're not here for uh, eternity. But when someone walks in and tells you that you're, um, God forbid, I don't even say, a situation, the, the example you gave right now, um, it's not the way of the world to bury a child and therefore, and, and, and the, the, the dealing with it, and that this situation is, is, is far more um, dramatic and traumatic and painful than dealing with the, the loss of a parent. I, I, I think so. Secondly, again, I want to give not something else as well to add to what you said. You said that people don't, uh, for years, didn't want to even speak about it. I gave a shiur this year on David Amelech's will. He left it Tzavah Ah, David Amelech. And before I started the shiur, I said to them, tell me, if they had two lecturers come, a social worker and a rabbi, whatever, and they were going to, and the, and the, and the topic was dealing with losses, how many of you would come to that, how, how many of you would come? One woman put up her hand. People don't want to deal with it. Sure. I think uh, also, you know, going back to what you said, and your point is well taken, but when uh, doctors will tell an individual, we have done everything we can, the rest is in God's hands, and we need to be able to make you as comfortable and free of pain as we possibly can, often the individual is outraged. How, how dare you tell me I'm dying? What do you mean I'm dying? And the family often will not sustain this. They will not tolerate hearing that their loved one will not be in this world in the next few months. And I, I think that it's a process, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross brilliantly laid out, it's a process that we go through and it's not something that we can rush and we can skip over. It needs to be processed and it needs the time for the person to understand and comprehend, not only psychologically but emotionally as well, what that journey is like. The uh, second stage that she talks about is anger. Why would somebody be angry? With God. Yes? Well, if they're still in denial. Mm -hmm. But like when you're transitioned, yes. it's like, if I don't believe I'm dying, why do other people, or why aren't they trying to save me? Like if other people think that I'm dying, but I don't, then I'm angry at them. Mm -hmm. Right. And people are often, who, are, who go through this stage, are very angry with their doctors. Why do you think that is? Why would you be angry with the doctor who she, he, she is doing their best? Why the be messenger. angry? The messenger. Kill the messenger. Oh, yeah. Kill the messenger. Or feeling a sense that the doctor is impotent. Mm -hmm. Why can't you save me? You know, you have so many advances in medicine take care of me, put me into an experimental group, let me take a different drug. But people are often very angry. Why is it happening to me? Yes? I think another source of that anger could be um, a loss of control. Yeah. When someone gets a diagnosis that's lifelong, that a lot of control is taken away from that person or the family dealing with it, and that can cause a lot of anger. Yeah. Why should somebody be angry with God? I don't I'm think they ready. should. I think that they might. Because they say, I'm not ready. 
And why, why are you doing this to me now? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just as an observation, to yes. many different cultures, and I, I apologize to the Americans in the group here, but I find that the Americans have a much more difficult, and I'm American by the way too, okay, have a much more difficult time dealing with that loss of control because what I get all the time is, well, can't, money's no object, can't we find something, a cure, some treatment, whatever. And because Americans are accustomed to getting everything they want. And that's yeah, not that's true. true. No, I, I, it's, it's true. It really, I, I'm sorry to say it. I, I'm, I'm also an American. I also like to get what I want, okay? But um, it's a very different cultural experience in dealing with, like, other places that aren't not so spoiled. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. This is this normal? Yeah. I'm saying everything yeah. that you're describing about yeah. how people react. It's quite normal. It's normal, right? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, of course. Normal, yeah. This is not this is not people with mental health right. problems right. necessarily. Right, exactly. Yes. The uh, the next um, the next aspect that she talks about is bargaining. <laughs> what does that mean? Bargaining. It means I'll right. say yes. I'll say to whom. Okay. I'll, I'll be McCuddle something, right, and then it will go away. Right. I'll be, the be I'll be a better girl. Yeah. I'll, be better. I'll, be better. I'll cover my hair for the rest of my life, and God will reward me by letting me live. We make bargains with whomever. We make bargains with the doctor. We make bargains with our loved ones, right? We make bargains with God. And if he really, truly loves me, he'll let me live. And that, of course, <laughs> is not always the case. If Somebody you think who survives the party, the party, the party, and hid in on one of those toilets for eight hours with two girls and did not lock the door because otherwise the, uh, the uh, Kamasani kid would have seen that it was, that it was locked and put their feet up so that their feet would not be shown. He, when he was interviewed, he has an amazing interview, and he said, what did, they said, what did you do? He said, I bargained with God. Mm -hmm. Is that in Hebrew, of course. I bargained with God. I said, you know what? I kept two Shabbosos. I wanted to do tshuva. This Shabbat, I really wanted to be in the party. I promise you, God, I promise you that if you get me out of here, because my parents will be devastated, I promise you, that I will take upon myself all the mitzvahs, mm -hmm. and he was spared. <laughs> and he was spared because he thinks God kept the bargain. Yes. <laughs> but let's understand that. That's really not accurate, yes? I mean, the anger stage, going back to the anger, um, I think very often the family could be members, I've experienced this, more anger than the past person that Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Why are they angry? Same type of thing, you know. I'm not ready for her or him, whoever it is, she or he, to be not in my life. Um, and we've done, we've done, we've done, and it's still not. How, I don't know, lots of reasons. It wasn't me. There are other people that. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And you look around. You know, he was a good person. He was so kind. He was shomer mitzvot, and yet he's going. So what more do does God want from this person? You know, we have those conversations with God at those terrible moments. You know, we also need to say thank you for what we do have every day. Yes? There's also a flip to that, which yes. is that our relationship was so fraught with, um, with difficulty, and now you're dying, you're leaving me, we haven't worked it through, we haven't had a chance to work it through, so there's there's, yes, you're leaving me, and I'm sad, and then you're leaving me, and boy, am I ticked off. <laughs> there was, uh, you're just reminding me, there was a wonderful movie. It's a very old movie. If you ever get a chance to see it, I recommend it highly. It was called I Never Sang for My Father, and um, it touched me very deeply, and it was about uh, a man in middle age and his relationship with his father was fraught with tension, with conflict all the years. As he came close, he receded. As he came close, 
he walked away and then the father dies and there are all these unresolved issues that will be with this adult son for the rest of his life and uh, at the end of the movie there's like an over voice which says and I'm paraphrasing life does not end a relationship but goes on seeking resolution in the mind and heart of the survivor and indeed if a person dies and you have unresolved issues or anger or frustration disappointment guilt in your relationship with that person you carry that for months maybe even years and so it is so it is uh, I don't have much time so I'm going to rush a little forgive me the next um, the next stage or another stage I should say is depression where a person is feeling sadness even fatigue unable to experience joy or pleasure and it's quite understandable a person is giving up and they are not able to kind of rally themselves to even enjoy whatever time they have left there's a last stage which I actually take issue with uh, I don't think all people do this at all in fact I think many people don't and that stage is acceptance does the person who's dying accept what is happening to him or her yes oh no I was thinking oh. I've had it in my life and both people accepted they were you know had the conversation of afterlife which helped the acceptance so then you're very lucky knowing that the neshama is eternal really was very helpful mm-hmm Mm -hmm. But many people don't accept, right, no. and many people die not accepting, and many, not many, countless families do not accept what has just happened, or the person is no longer breathing, or the monitor is a flat line, mm -hmm. and now people are screaming and crying and wailing, and it happened. Mm -hmm. And were they prepared? Some yes, some no, but it's it's a difficult time. I think acceptance has a mixed, mixed understanding for all of us. Yes? I heard something very interesting once that the Ramban says that helps this particular problem. He says, he asked, why is it that people, even when they're 95 years old and had a good life and everything, that the relatives will say afterwards, it wasn't fair, it shouldn't have been this way. And he answered, because deep inside of every person, they actually know that's not really what Hashem wanted. The way Hashem really created the world was so that nobody would die. Right. So there really is a program, so to speak, a spiritual neshama program in every human soul that knows this is not really the way Hashem wanted it. So that feeling of like, this shouldn't be happening, I'm not accepting this, I, this is not where it is, comes from a spiritual place that he, the Ramban discusses this. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I wanted to tell a story about a patient I had. I was a young nurse, and he was dying, and he had about a month, and he came to me and he said, I'd like to speak to you privately. I said, okay. And he came up to me and he said, I'm going home for Shabbat, and I want to know if I can make love with my wife. So I'm thinking to myself, how come they didn't teach me this in nursing school? <laughs> how come they didn't teach me this? Were you going to answer? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't a sex therapist yet. <laughs> and how come the doctors don't talk about this with him? Because that's their business <laughs> to talk to them about these things. And then I said to myself, is this what he's thinking about? Mm -hmm. Right before Why he gets... Mm -hmm. Wait, okay, let's yeah. <laughs> nurse. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and I said, Revadai, <laughs> go. And he went home and, and I just, when he died, I just felt... That, it, that he wa he was very accepting of what was happening, and he wanted to live his last moments in the best way. He beautiful. Could. It's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to wrap up now, and I want to um, uh, give a quote from a um, philosopher named Wolfelt. He's not very well known, but I read something that um, is universal and that touched me very deeply. I hope it does for you as well. Grief is a natural extension of the, the ability of a human being 
to give and receive love. Think about that. If you can give and receive love, you will experience grief one day in your life. Isn't that beautiful? I had to remember that Hashem who gave life is also the one that takes life. And then again, he gives and he takes the same source. And that helped me as well. And the book Consolation by Dr. Lamb. Yeah. You know, Death and Dying, when you said that was like Kubler-Ross was like the guru in it. But the Jewish book in many households is that purple book. Yeah. That is Death and Dying. Mm-hmm. But the next book, the sequel, is called Consolation. And I really, really felt like that helped me. Good. Good for you. Okay. okay. Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I feel bad that I did, wasn't here earlier to meet everybody to go around, so I'm not going to um, waste your time on that, but I feel just in this in the couple of minutes that we've had so far together, I wish I could hear from each of you. It, it sounds like you're all well-versed not only in Tanakh, but in life and, and your own professions as well, and I'd love to come back and hear from all of you. But, um, but Zmira asks me to speak, and when Zmira asks me to jump, I say how high, and... That's what I do, so so I am here today. Um, thank you so much for sharing um, the 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 Aleph bed of of grief um, was just laid out in front of us, and and for me when when I hear you know grief and death and dying and and all of that there are different parts of that also you know we 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 look at the finality of death as 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 grief. But of course, we all know that in life, it's not only with death. And, and as we all know with, with this war as well, there are many different losses that we have that isn't only with death. And we all know people that have, have had those different losses of limbs, of, of different abilities, of different, of different things that, that people are going through. And that loss and that grief is something that we are all meeting on on a on a daily basis um you know as as crazy as that may sound i just want to put on my timer so that i could see how much time i'm using okay um so going back to that complicated stages i want to i want to um give two personal anecdotes um from from my life but for my personal life and my life in my role as a yoshevet rosh of the shuv and as and as a chaplain as well so um, I was I went to to America two weeks ago, and I went to visit my daughter. It was beautiful, and my husband and I decided that we we really wanted to go together to go visit our daughter there, and we were planning on going in October or November, but yeah, <laughs> yes, but that was that was our plan. But obviously that didn't work out like that, um, and and then the mascure of the shuv came. He was on Milouim. The, the city controller of the yeshuv was on Miloim. So there was no way I was leaving until he came back. He came back from Miloim. So I'm like, as soon as he came back, I'm like, I'm flying to America now. So I went. And my husband and I decided we'll go separately so that this way we won't be, we won't be gone at the same time. And, of course, um, during that time, there was, we live in Mitzvah Yericho, we, Zmir and I, um, we live in Mitzvah Yericho, and if anybody has been down to the Dead Sea or Malay Adumim, you know, as you're coming up, there's that checkpoint, and um, two Thursdays ago, um, my children were on the bus, and they they heard gunshots, and Zmira was on the bus with them, so I got a divu off right away. I got an accounting right away of what was going on, and the another woman on the bus who had clearly been in, a, in another terrorist attack. She knew exactly what to do. She told everybody to get down. Thank God she did. So then, so then my children and everyone else on the bus was spared from seeing what was happening right next to them, um, and the. Off. What? The base off it. <laughs> we all peeked out after. Yeah. Yeah. And she was good. what? She's laughing. Was it good? No. no. There was a curse. You know. I know, but I was wondering why she's like, "Oh, they all saw and she was laughing." Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's just no. Stress, stress. How we deal with stress. It's just <laughs> um, so the terrorist was shot. One of one of the three terrorists was shot right next to the bus, and and he laid there with his with his grenade right next to him, um, and. 
in all his glory. Um, for for a half an hour um, until they let the bus until they let the bus through. Um, that's story number one. Story number two, um, while I was in America also, obviously, um, some, um, somebody had, somebody had, I had written to somebody at two in the morning Israel time, and, and she was, and she was awake, and I said, I said to her, like, why are you awake? And she said, oh, yeah, whatever. She gave me some, some stupid answer, and, and I, and I was busy, I was absorbed with, with my own children and my own life, that I didn't even hear her hear her answer, and I accepted her stupid answer, and and I and I moved on. I moved on with my life. We're gonna get back to those two stories in a minute. Okay, so um, I do a lot. I, I, I do a lot of talks on Nichama Velim and Biker Cholim, and which are very interconnected. And um, as it, it's very clear from the women that have spoken. From watching um, everybody here, everyone here is well versed in in both Nicham Avelim and Biker Holim, and we know how intertwined they are um, from from the Rambam. Um, the halachos of Biker Holim are in the the, the topic of Nicham Avelim because there the, the, all kinds of Torahs on it. But but I think that they're they're very closely related in how we and how we approach them. But also you know that 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 that. Um, connection to death and when somebody is sick there is that rendezvous with death and dying that people are it's a little bit of a wake-up call of we're mortal and the secret is is that we're all going to die and and when somebody gets sick we say that it could it could happen it could it can happen and it can happen right now and um and those and those things are are very connected um and the i i i used to start my talk with with um, talking about how the, the halacha is, when you go to a, to a shiva house, you don't talk. You let the avel talk. And and that's that's a that's a major that's a major lesson for for all of us. We all we all enjoy talking. And what we need to do when we when we when we come to a shiva house is to just sit, and we're going to listen. But then I added it something to be to before that. Um, this is something actually that I adopted from Jason Weiner, um, the, the senior chaplain in, in Cedar Sinai, um, it, and he he's 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 he also wrote a book on chaplaincy, and I highly recommend it. Um, and he's a he's an Adam Gadol in this in this area. And Rabbi Weiner said the first the first rule is to show up, mm-hmm. is to just show up, and. You know, you know, when we talk about death and dying, you know, and that, you know, nobody, nobody wants to talk about it, you know, but, and which is true, and we kind of want to avoid it, but by just showing up, by making that shiva call, by, by, by asking how somebody is, you're showing up, and then, and then you can be quiet and listen. That's where I made the mistake with my friend, when she gave me her 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 stupid answer, and she says to me, yeah, whatever, I'm just awake, you know. I should have I should have peeled another layer there. I should have been actively listening. One of our one of our greatest tools that we use as chaplains, probably the greatest tool that we can use is to be active listeners. And and everyone here is an active listener. I could, I could see as I as I look around the room everyone's nodding their heads and mm-hmm. and you can you, I I feel I feel you with me. But that is that is what we're giving over always and it's that active listening that we need to be doing. It's the listening and the hearing. I didn't hear her. It took me a full week, a full week, to, 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 to really, for it to, to, to settle with me. And, and then I wrote back to her and I'm like, how's it going? And um, you know, I, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with first level God talk, right? So we like to say, you know, how are you doing? And what's our answer? Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Really? <laughs> really? Because because I'm 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 just as familiar as you. Hashem Hashem Baruch Hashem Baruch Hashem. You know, like we're you know it goes you know it's, what's 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 going on? You know, you just said Baruch Hashem. You didn't give me any answer. And we need to peel that extra layer. We need to be an active listener. We need to look at somebody's face when they say, even if they're gonna say, good, feeling good. No you're, no, you're not. You're just saying that because you want to. You want me to be quiet. 
so then I peel the, the, the next layer and I said to her, you know, what, you know, how are you doing? And, and then she told me that her son came back from, from Gaza and he was, and he had, I don't know what, the, what, 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 what clinical word we would use for it, but a complete, a complete breakdown and was, and was, um, and was, was, was admitted to, to a psych unit. And and he and he's still there, um, but what 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 I think all of us, if there's one message that all of us can go home with today, including myself, obviously, is to be that active listener, and to really take that and to really use that, and that was my mistake with with her at that moment. I don't know. I don't know if she would have been ready at that moment to share. You know, she she did give me her 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 first level answer. But to be able to be open, and that even if we make a mistake, and we and we didn't we didn't peel that layer, then there's always tomorrow, and you can still go back and you can still say, "How are you doing today?" And to be able to show up day after day after day. The, the, the long-term grief that all of us are dealing with in this war is something that needs to be visited day after day after day. We need to be listening, we need to be actively listening to ourselves and of course to the people around us. So, yeah. My husband is a chaplain. Can you tell me your name? I'm sorry. Adela Berman. My husband is a chaplain and he says a chaplain has to be like a rabbit. <laughs> Big ears and a small mouth. That's really <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. The name of the organization that I work for is called Kashuvot. To listen. To listen. That and that's and that's the job. In the center. Yeah. So, so I, I, there's, you know, there's Chazal say that when you are Mavakir Cholim, you take one sixtieth of, what does that mean? One, what, what does that mean, one sixtieth? What does that, and, you know, okay, we, we see one sixtieth a lot in, 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 in one halacha. Sixth one sixtieth of the illness. Of the illness. What what is that what does that mean? What what could that possibly mean? I show up, that somebody has a terminal a terminal illness. I'm not I'm not I'm not curing. The person's on hospice. We're not curing them. There are no interventions anymore. This is it. This is it. I'm not taking the illness away. And that I'm going I work in a hospice. I know I know I know that I'm not I'm not fixing their 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 illness. The cancer is going to kill them. I'm not taking one sixtieth away. What am I taking away? And, and what, what, I, what I think it really comes down to is that is what, if, I would, if I would put up an image of what chaplaincy is, it would be this. It's the holding. It's the putting your hands out and holding with them. And that is the 160th. And it's more than 160th. But what it is is it's not, we're not going to cure, we're not curing the terminally ill patient that's on hospice they're dying and whatever pain the person has is is fine and it's there but what we can do is be there with them what is we can hold of what 160th of the illness why 160th that, that's what that's what Chazal say I know why I'm asking you why why do I think why do they say 160th yeah I don't know it's a it's a measurement. It's paya. There are lots of other. There are. Batal b'shishim. We have in paya. We have one sixtieth of the field. Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a number that's put out there, and obviously when we say when we say you know that's there there are halachic ramifications when we're talking about batal b'shishim. You're talking about a halachic measurement. I don't think that in illness we can measure with numbers, you know, in that in that sense. As much as we'd like to look at science and be able to say that medicine is science, 
we all know that medicine, you know, only goes so far with science and, Sleep and well, you know, with, with what? Sleep. Yeah. 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 I think I also think it's also with Nebua, that it's a Chad Chalkei Shishim Nebua as well, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure of that. But I think it also, it, it, again, measuring, it's a certain measure that the Halacha decides on its measure. But I think that when you're with a person who is, who is suddenly ill, and even if you spend with them five minutes, if they are with you and you know they're with you, then you, they've certainly they've changed their their matzav ruach. They feel they they. They're given moments, moments. They're given and we cannot measure time. We have no idea me- uh, what that means. That those few moments, it's for for that person, it's an olam for his family. If his family is sitting next to him, and you come in and you sit with them, and you you whatever you have said to them, and then you walk out, and then after the nifta, the family will say, you know, I remember. That you came, and for those few minutes that you that you were with my mother, she suddenly perked up. Mm-hmm. She was suddenly suddenly there was this light on her face that wasn't there beforehand, mm-hmm. and I'll always remember that. Mm-hmm. The members of the family can say that to you. Mm-hmm. So again, it's not what the a hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, and 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 I think that, that that what you said is exactly right. When you hold your hands out, you 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 let the person really know you're nodding your head. You're actively there with them. They feel that, they internalize that, and it makes it easier. It makes it 160th easier. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. There was a hosp- wait, wait, sorry, what's your uh, name? My name is Gail Forsky. There was a hospice nurse when my husband was dying, and it was going to be moments, and she said to me, don't start grieving yet, wait. <laughs> she still have a relationship, wait. Mm-hmm. And that was the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've yeah. seen so uh, many times where my name is Marion Crow. Thank you. <laughs> I've seen so many times where the hospice doctor has said, "Okay, you better call the family." Mm-hmm. Okay. I've said what? Sorry. Call, call the family yeah. to be with that doctor. Like the end. Okay. We call the family. Everybody comes in, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, <laughs> and then they rally. They rally. Mm-hmm. They've made liars out of me so many times. Okay. And the family leaves. <laughs> And it's like it's like they got enough koach to go for like another week or two, and then they die. Usually mm-hmm. they're sleeping. It's it's amazing what the power of family around that person does. It's 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 I just see it so many times. There's no doubt in my mind that that gives them koach. And um, yeah, a hundred a hundred percent. There's a there's there's something there's something about it. And this is not this is the, like I, this isn't a small thing. That Chazal say, but you see it time and time again. You know, we I, I had a patient in in hospice, and she was furious, furious with the food. She didn't eat anything. She never ate anything. She couldn't eat. She couldn't eat. She was furious with the food. It was disgusting. She and but she could she couldn't eat. And so one of the kitchen workers was was like, it, it looked, it appeared that she was completely fed up, because every time, one of the nurses or the dietitian or the social worker would come down and complain to the kitchen staff about. So, so this 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 kitchen worker comes upstairs, and it looked like in a furious state. And she says she says to the patient, she says, put she, she and this is where it was like so amazing. She took her hands, she put them out, and she says, what can I do for you? Whatever you want, I will do. And she said, I want tomatoes. So she said, you want, you want a whole tomato? She said, yes. And every day until she died, she got a tomato on her plate. And that's what she needed. That's what she needed, but that's not what she needed. What did she need? She needed the 160th. Yeah. Yeah, she needed something that was the same she, what you want. Well, yeah. She never touched the tomatoes. She never touched them. She, she didn't eat anything. Hurt. She was hurt. She was hurt. Yeah. She, was hurt. Okay. she just needed someone to say, I'm here with you. I hear you. I hear you. I'm here and I'm here. I see. And I and I see you. I hear you and I am here. And that's what and that's what she did. And since we're in Chodesh Adar and just wrap it up with one last one last thought you know with with esther esther hamalka you know it seems like she's kind of like this passive 
person. She's kind of like doing everything, right? And then, and then you know, she's what what I always when I when I talk to to teens and and seminary students, I always say like you're you need to build your backpack. So like you're gonna walk around. Some of us call it pekalach that we have <laughs> that we're schlepping with us. But I think that those pekalach are also that's also our parachute. That's what's that's what gives us our chiyus also. And when you have that backpack with you, you 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 fill up your your resume, your backpack with whatever throughout your life. And that's what Esther and Malka was doing. She was she was building she was building it up. And then Mordechai says to her, And all of us that are here today decided to come here because we all felt that in our lives we're at this specific eight. And we don't know what tomorrow and what today is going to bring. But we need to know that we need to show up mm-hmm. and kazot. And this may be our moment and we need to be prepared. We're all in it together. Going to America was was, was such an incredible experience for me, being able to see how the, how the Jews of the diaspora, which was always like a topic that we always talked about, how are we connecting the Jews of the diaspora to the Jews in, in Israel? It was incredible, the, the, the feeling of everybody packing duffels and sending, sending perm costumes and, and, and gear and everybody on the streets talking about the shachpatzim. And, the, and I'm like, how do you know what a shachpatzim is? Mean, who, who's ever used that word before? And all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the ceramic vests. Yes, and now they need to. Right, and now and everybody, everybody knows everybody knows that you need a level, this level and that level, and, and this, what they use, it has to make sure that the ballistic missile, missile can get through, Where and this is you? only good for, what? Where were you? So I was in America. In the five towns. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was. I was in the five towns. I was in the five towns, and it was absolutely. It was absolutely. It was absolutely amazing. It was really. Everybody. Everybody that I saw had stickers with a number of days, and they had necklaces with a you know to free the hostages. It was absolutely inspiring, and and we should all continue with that. No, no, I, I don't mean it like that. I just, I spent about three out of the last four weeks in America, and I spent a lot of time feeling very sad at the disconnect. I didn't, I, you know, I think there are certain communities that are very Israel connected, but I don't know that it's necessary. I think I really um, related to what Lynn said that you weren't here, but she was set, mentioned earlier. People, Chutznikim here, and also Chutznikim in Chutzlar, it's our, Many of them want to feel deeply connected, but they just, you know, if they don't have money to send, which not everybody does, like there is, there, I think that there is a feeling of how do we relate, and I thought, I felt for myself very deeply, how do I relate? They're also having an experience, mm-hmm. and to try to bridge it, I just didn't think was as easy as like what you're, what you're making it seem like. I think the five towns is unique. I don't know that it's like that everywhere. Oh no, and not everybody in the five towns is like that either. No, no. Some of the neighborhoods and friends have no idea. Right. No. Internet, Yeah, no, not not everywhere. Not everywhere is like that. Not everything is roses at all. But not at all. And um, but I mean, they're also they also are going through their own their own their own crisis as well. And and that's something that we need to be sensitive to as well. I mean, they they have they have their own struggles and chutzpahs that we need to be sensitive to. And and I mean it's it's a you know I I would not I I I would not trade places you know I'm I'm very I'm very happy you know living in the settlements and uh, you know yeah my son just got back from um, part of the organization they were raising had the gala in New York they were raising money he said. Ima, he said one of the things that he just couldn't relate to, he, and it was really surprising to him, the American Jews are afraid to show their Jewishness. Correct. They were afraid to come to certain events they had. They said, we really want to support you. They take us we really want to support you, but we're afraid to be there. Okay, this is something that's going on. Yeah. I just spoke to a woman who came from to visit her mother here from uh, San Francisco. She had to leave San Francisco Okay, she's still living over there. She said, before October 7th, the world was a stick of Jews, non-Jews, everything. She's a very secular woman. She says, since then, her world, a friend, yeah, like this. Her, 
She says the people that she has been friends with for a long time have just totally abandoned her because of her support for Israel. And she says she mm -hmm. actually moved and has not given her address to anybody because she's wow. afraid of herself. Maybe she should move here. Well, she's trying to. She's trying to. She's trying to. She her daughter to get out of college. Yeah. Yeah. She's in yeah. public school. Yeah. But it's deafening. Mm -hmm. it's very, they're really afraid. One or two yeah. colleagues said something. Mm -hmm. The rest of them never, ever addressed me. Nothing. And they even know I have a daughter that lives here. So they didn't even say something about that. Nothing. I left January 1st. Nothing. I go good in social media. Like, I see news and beautiful things. And then I scroll and I'll, I'll see, like, someone yeah. going on a vacation, like, posting pictures to their vacation in Aruba, like, during oh, their Oh, yeah. Aruba. We yeah. must know the same people. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbis have their status well. Oh, my God. That's the rabbis in, in New York area have addressed that as well. People have a status, you know, their way of living, their level of entertainment, and mm -hmm. Pesach, people are going to Florida. Mm -hmm. They still Florida, have to live Florida, in the way they're used business. to. They don't have to post about it. <laughs> well, my husband's in Gaza. I'm not saying that, I'm not judging. I'm s I I was just that. saying that. <laughs> <I'm just saying laughs> I'm just saying from their standpoint, they need oh, to entertain their kids, and that's what they're used to. It's going to change. Yeah, I was going to say, I was gonna say we have to go down in another minute. So first of all, Lisa, I want to finish with one sentence. And then if anyone has a specific question for one of them, we might have like two or minutes or so to answer. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with, with one thought and then just mm -hmm, to, sure. to whatever, I just want to give a bracha to, to all of us here and to myself is to, um, is, to be, is, is to really show up and continue to be active listeners and to take, these, to take the stages of grief and know that when we're meeting somebody in their lives, we have no idea where they are. And we need to be that active listener and to really understand <coughs> where each person is and that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Just on the show I have, I have a memory that's 18 years old, but that's the power of it. It's 18 years old. So 18 years ago, almost 18 years ago, we lost my oldest sister. I'm not sure we ever recovered. Sister. And um, we were sitting Shiva in Flatbush. And I won't say his name, but one of the Rabbanim that I'm in touch with, I call her Fanid Shilas. He's an older colleague of my husband. He lives in the outer reaches of the metropolitan area. It's a real schlep. He walked in the door. What? He came in. And I, you know, I don't even remember what he said or if he said anything. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, I, like who am I? I'm not, and like, he came. And to this day, I can't believe, I should believe it, but the fact that he came, it was such a schlep. And it's 18 years ago, and it's still a precious, precious memory. The fact that he walked in the door and came to pay the show.